Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic junior doctor working in the UK. Before we start, I just want to apologise for the lack of optimal lighting in this video. The light that I usually use to light my videos actually just broke literally as I was about to start filming. So um, that's going to have to be waiting to be replaced, um, but hopefully they'll get sorted soon, so please forgive me. But anyway, let's go back to the video. So I graduated my medical school in the summer of 2020, so that's just over a year ago now, so I've just completed my F1 year and I'm now an F2 or an SHO as they say, as a senior house officer. Overall, I really enjoyed my F1 year, I feel like I've learned a lot and mainly just got used to being a junior doctor. Um, but there is a very steep learning curve and I think as everyone would agree with me and my, all my predecessors, there's a lot of things that medical school didn't prepare you for an F1, especially the kind of non-medical side to the logistics of doing the job and the communication skills and working with other health professionals and patients as well. And so here are the 10 tips that I've compiled together and this is a combination of such a things that I've learned over the last year, things that I wish I had known when I started F1 and the kind of common questions that I see trending on social media and hopefully this is useful to those of you who are just starting your career as a doctor and also for uh, future incoming medical students. So without further ado, obviously everything is timestamped as usual, but let's just jump into the video. So the first thing I want to talk about is reviewing a high news or unwell patients out of hours. This is probably one of the most dreaded parts of starting as a new doctor and despite however many sim sessions that you do in medical school with a dummy and doing ATE, I think nothing quite prepares you for the first time you are dealing with a really seriously unwell patient on your own out of hours with no one around to help you. It can feel really daunting at first and you might think, oh, I don't know where to start, but just remember to do the basics. So do your AT assessment. There's a reason why they drill it into all of us and start your basic investigations like taking blood, taking a blood gas, doing a 12 lead ECG for chest pain, or if you have any concerns about breathing, you can order a chest X-ray. And always consider things like the sepsis six as well. And don't forget the kind of basic management that you can do, like starting fluids, starting some empirical antibiotics, uh, you know, measuring fluid input, output, and that sort of thing. After assessing the patient, I would just take a minute to gather your thoughts about what's happening and think about why this patient is deteriorating or what is causing them to be unwell. And at this point, I find that usually I would have come to one of three uh, thoughts. One is, I think I know what's going on and I know how to manage it. Two would be, I think I might know what's going on, but I'm not entirely sure on my management. And I'm not sure if I've missed anything. And three is, I just have no idea what's going on. Either way, as a new F1, a good rule of thumb is for anyone who is seriously unwell that you're concerned about, it would be reasonable to escalate and just check with a senior. Even if you think you have a good idea of what's going on, it's always nice to have someone senior confirm your plan and just make sure you haven't missed any steps or extra investigations that you ought to consider. Speaking of asking advice from seniors, this links into my next point as an F1, which a lot of people find intimidating when they first start as a junior doctor, is making referrals to other specialties and asking for advice. This includes things like, you know, during ward round, your consultant might ask you to, can you speak to cardiology about this patient who's had chest pain and we can't figure out why? Or can you speak to radiology to discuss and vet a CT scan? Or asking another specialty to come review a patient or even to take over their care? Now, firstly, I think everyone knows this in the kind of medical field is that sometimes people can be nasty on the phone. And I just want to make it really, really clear to all of you who are watching this video, there's absolutely no excuse for anyone to be rude to you on the phone there is just not even if it is a bad referral or even if the referral is not appropriate for that specialty they should just let you know that and you know bullying undermining harassment any of that is just unacceptable behavior regardless of the situation having said that some of the kind of tips for making a good referral and avoiding rejection so to speak is firstly make sure you know everything about the patient so before you pick up the phone to call the other specialty just make sure that you've actually read through the patient's notes that you know exactly what's gone on with them since they come into hospital make sure that you look up their relevant blood results or scan results before you pick up the phone as well because you'll probably be asked about them the second tip i have in terms of making referrals is always know what the 
clinical question is you're trying to answer. So sometimes consultants go around on a wall round and they might make like an offhanded comment like, oh yeah, and can you speak to rheumatology about this patient? And they just kind of move on. Always clarify with either the registrar or the consultant or even other members on your junior team who know maybe a bit about why you're making this referral, um, just to make sure you've got everything laid out and you know what you're asking. Now, if the referral or a request for a scan, for example, is declined for whatever reason, I would take down the name of the person who's declining the referral. And I would also ask them what the reason is for declining the referral. And they might say, oh, it's because this is an entirely inappropriate reason to refer them to us, which in that case, you should feed it back to your registrar consultant. Or sometimes they just want more information and need kind of a more complex discussion, in which case, again, you should just escalate this to your registrar consultant and they might want to discuss in the specialty themselves. The third thing for F1, which again, is not something that is taught very well in medical school, but is certainly something that is really useful to be aware of, is giving appropriate handovers. So handovers exist because hospitals obviously have 24 hour care and you provide a portion of that every day, whether that's during the daytime or during the nighttime or twilight or whatever it is. And it's kind of quite hard to explain this uh, until you just kind of get first-hand personal experience about what is an appropriate handover. But the kind of general rule of thumb is anything urgent that is going to change the patient's management overnight should be chased up and handed over to the night team. So this may include things like chasing an urgent CT scan to look for bowel obstruction or perforation, because these things would mean you probably need to discuss it with the on-call surgical team and registrar who may or may not need the patient to theatre uh, overnight to operate on them. So that's obviously an urgent thing that needs chasing. In comparison to that, a routine MRI scan to look for a tiny foci of infection in someone who is completely clinically well it's really unlikely to happen overnight, so there's no point handing that over. You should also hand over things like reviewing patients who are unwell, who need certain tests at certain times. So for example, a patient at 4.30 who's got a lactate of 4.5 on their VBG might need a repeat VBG in an hour's time. So that sort of thing needs handing over. And finally, you should also hand over any unwell patients who may kick off overnight or who the night team might get asked to see. Um, and the reason for handing these patients over to be aware of, but not for any active jobs at the moment, is if the night team then gets called to see them because they've deteriorated or become acutely unwell, they already have sort of a background idea of what's going on with the patient rather than starting from scratch, reading the notes and all of that. So it kind of just makes things a little bit easier for your colleagues on call. There are also unspoken things that you should never hand over. And again, this is not really talked about at medical school. So the kind of number one thing that you should never, ever, ever hand over is a PR exam. It's just not pleasant. You're not going to make any friends. And the other thing that people hate in handovers is handing over bloods to be taken. Um, if it's routine bloods during the day that should have been chased, for example, if the phlebotomist missed it, the day team really should have taken the steps to take that blood. You shouldn't be handing that over for the night team to do. That's just really not fair. If it's things like repeat bloods for, you know, a repeat troponin in three hours time, that sort of thing, that's reasonable. Um, but something you can do to be nice to your colleagues again is potentially ask the nurses on the ward to give it a try at, you know, 8 p.m. or whenever it is. And that kind of takes a bit of... Uh, uh, a stress out of your colleagues and on a, on a busy shift. Now let's talk about the flip side. So if you were the person receiving the handovers as the night team, as the night junior or whatever, there's a couple of questions I always ask for everything that's handed over to me. Um, the first is who's the patient, what they come into hospital for, what's their background? The second question is, is it going to be done overnight? So like I said earlier, sometimes CT scans or certain scans might not be actually done overnight as an urgent scan and they probably won't happen until tomorrow anyway. So it's worth clarifying that so you don't have to chase after scans that are not going to happen in the first place. And finally, and the most important question that you need to ask is what do you want me to do with the results? So whether this is, oh, you know, 
Um, they've been put on therapeutic vaccine for a possible PE after their CTPA, can you take them off it if they don't need it? Or things like, well, when this scan comes back, the surgical registrar wanted to know the results, so can you call them and discuss it? And that sort of thing. The fourth tip I have is also relating to out of hours work and it's triaging bleeps out of hours. During the night time, you get a variety of bleeps, especially if it's busy shift and you need to prioritize them. You need to triage them. And usually the kind of bleeps that sometimes you get uh, which is completely inappropriate for nighttime, you would just need to say, look, this is a day team job and I can't do it out of hours. And that would include things like, you know, writing a TTA for a discharge the next day, never gonna happen overnight. Um, or for things like, can you rewrite a drug chart or write for medication that the patient takes at 9 a.m. in the morning? That doesn't need to be done overnight. That's something that the day team needs to sort out. And it's also about just prioritizing what is urgent and what is not. So a patient who's using a seven should always be reviewed first compared to, you know, someone who uh, needs paracetamol prescribing or someone who wants to speak to the doctor about their overall treatment plan. And that sort of thing, you know, really isn't urgent for a well patient. And lastly, in terms of out of hours and triaging bleeps, I would just add in final tip is to know what services are available. So at my hospital where I did my F1, um, they have a hospital at night service, which is led by senior nurse practitioners who can do a number of things, including prescribe certain drugs, um, take bloods under ultrasound and review people who are using a certain score and that sort of thing. And they're really, really useful people to have around. And especially if you're swamped on the night shift and you get bleep for the 10 time about you know a patient who's really difficult to bleed and that sort of thing you can always outsource this you can ask nurses kindly well you know like if you guys are struggling on the ward please can you contact the hospital at night practitioners you can do this under ultrasound and they can have a go and you still can't get it i'll come and have a look making mistakes so everyone at whatever stage no matter their role um, in whatever specialty will be worried about mistakes all the time it's just the nature of the job um, but I think as an F1, you know, with a bit of imposter syndrome sprinkled in, with a bit of inexperience and uncertainty sprinkled in, um, we're all a bit afraid of every little thing we do when we first start, even something as simple as just prescribing metformin or something. The things to keep in mind is that firstly, everyone makes mistakes. At the end of the day, we are all human. We're not you know, even consultants will make mistakes. And the important thing is to um, learn from your mistakes if they unfortunately do happen um, and learn from that experience and ensure that you don't make that mistake again. And secondly, for people who are really concerned about mistakes that go unnoticed or, you know, gets out of hours, you know, there's a reason that there are so many roles in the hospital and all the roles are designed to look after each other. And if a catastrophic event occurs, it's because, you know, the, the problem has slipped through multiple levels. And, you know, there are, there are a lot more things in the system to catch these mistakes than you realise, I think. You have your SHO, you have your registrar, and you have a consultant who will most likely, one of those senior people, review the patient daily. Or if it's a prescribing problem, there is always a pharmacist on the ward during the day who checks all your prescriptions, who checks all your TTAs. And, you know, there is out of hours um, cover as well. So if something slipped through the daytime, people will get called out of hours. Yeah, mistakes are daunting. Um, everyone gets them. The important thing is to learn from them um, so that you don't make the same mistake again. And at the same time, don't worry too, too much about it because there is a system in place for this sort of thing. And as the very junior person in the team, you should not be making such big decisions anyway that would be, you know, a life or death decision. Um, I mean, if you're being made to do that, then something has come wrong. Okay, so that's probably the heaviest point in this entire video. So let's go back to the lighter stuff. So taking breaks, there should seldomly be anything stopping you from going to lunch on time or leaving on time unless a patient is so unwell that it would be unsafe to do so. People will always ask you to do things and there will always be jobs to do on the ward. But the important thing again is to triage these tasks. So for example, if you left for half an hour to go and have lunch, you know, the patient is not going to come to harm most of the time. If the TTA is not written for another half an hour, it really 
really isn't going to stop anything happening and just kind of take care of self throughout the day make sure you know you're, you're getting time to to go and have a drink of water to go to the toilet and to go and eat your food and that sort of thing as well in terms of staying late um most of the time you should try not to stay late at all i mean again the hospital is 24 hours cover use it hand over stuff that is not done aside from the you know unmentionables like prs and things if you consistently don't go home on time there is a system in place called exception reporting where you report the extra hours that you've worked and this does two things the first is you will get reimbursed in some way either as a time in lieu for the extra time you've worked or you'll get paid the kind of normal rate for working for working that extra hour and the second thing exception reporting does is it gets flagged up to the department and also your supervisors so they know that their genius is working overtime so that they know that the staffing is inadequate on the note of working hours and taking breaks and stuff annual leave this is really important so for anyone who's working in the nhs for the first five years you're entitled to 27 days of annual leave per year which is nine days per four month rotation my only tip for you for this is to consider your annual leave and book them as early as possible um, when your rotation starts the reason being you need six weeks notice for any annual leave to go through as a general rule of thumb in most trusts and if you leave it um, as time goes on more and more people will book annual leave possibly towards the middle to the late end of the placement and then you'll really struggle to find days where you can actually take leave the problem of annual leave is if you don't take it in that rotation they don't roll over to the next one so i think if you have like one or two annual leave days left often what the trust will do is either pay you for those days as if you've worked eight till five but if you have multiple days of annual leave that you haven't taken oftentimes what happens is you just lose the annual leave so just make sure you take your leave e-portfolios and wba so everyone needs to get signed off at the end of year at what is called an arcp where they review everything that you've done that year and make sure you satisfy the outcomes as listed by the gmc part of this involves things like an e-portfolio usually on horus for england trainees and uh, something else for wales i believe um, but the idea is the same and you have to do things like cbds and mini kexes and get signed off on certain skills in order to pass your f1 year my recommendation is to do these early. The ARCP is not in August, so not the full 12 months, usually in like June, May or June. So get your sign offs done, get your CBDs and mini cases signed off. And that just means the sooner you get them signed off, the less you have to worry about them. So I would seek out all the opportunities. And every time you do a cannula, just make sure like someone is happy to sign you off. Or if you've clocked a patient in, just make sure you turn it into a CBD or anytime someone watches you do anything at all, make it a mini kex. But you know, just consider opportunities where you can get those things signed off as early as possible so you don't have to worry about them. So uh, taste the days and building your CV in F1. This is obviously my uh, uh, topic of interest if you've seen the content on my channel before. Um, but no, so things to keep in mind at the minimum is you get five taste the days in F1. These taster days are basically where you have to be on site in the hospital or prove that you're in another hospital if the specialty isn't available in that hospital, um, pursuing a specialty of interest or trying out a day in another specialty. For me, I organised one of my taster days to be a research taster day where I was involved in a big sort of research project uh, qualitative meetings with patients and interested parties to uh, formulate a bunch of outcomes of interest for a certain disease and we wrote that up in a paper actually and that was one of my taster days and then the other four of my taster days I spent in vascular surgery which is what I wanted to do and that was a mix of um, going to theatres, going to clinics, shadowing the registrar on call and seeing new patients admitted to the hospital. Um, so it can really be anything that you want to make it out to be. The problem with taster days as well is if you don't do it in F1, those days are just gone. You can't claim them back in any in any way. You can't get paid for them or anything like that. So just make sure you do organise those. In terms of CV opportunities, well, Realistically, it hasn't changed that much from medical school in F1, and I already have a series on my channel which is covering exactly how to develop your medical CV, and most of the things on there for medical students is still 100% relevant as an F1 doctor. So things like research and audits, 
go up to a consultant, go into a registrar, ask if they have any ideas, anything on the ward that they can improve. You know, consider studying for an exam if you are going to, if you know what you want to do. So I sat my MRCS part A in F1 during a uh, slightly less intense rotation and that worked out well for me. Um, just be aware of what's needed for kind of progression of training as usual because the application timeline, if you're going straight on from F2 that is, will be uh, literally in the middle of F2. So you don't actually have that much time really. So if you're someone who wants to consider building your CV and things, um, it is worth considering that in F1. But do also give yourself some time to just get used to being a doctor because that can be very difficult as well. Um, you know, like when I first started F1, I already had a project that I was doing that was carried over from medical school. And for the first couple of months of working, I couldn't actually dedicate any time to that project at all because I was just so exhausted after working because it's a new job, you have to exert a lot of mental energy and by the time you come home you're quite exhausted at that new routine. So I didn't really get around to sparing any time and effort and mental energy really to do anything outside of just, you know, just being a doctor. Um, and that leads into my final point is that it does get easier over time. Um, like everything, you know, with practice comes experience and with experience you'll find a job a lot easier. Um, in your first rotation it will probably take you a good couple of months to even settle in to the rotation and by the time you've done that you're moving on to your next rotation. But you'll find that each time you do that it takes you less and less time to adapt to the new environment and the way the new team works and you know things that seem really difficult when you first start like you know you'll take ages and ages trying to decide um, what fluid you want to give someone for maintenance and you would take ages and ages um, trying to write a discharge letter and TTOs or you know you would take forever trying to assess someone who is you know got a bit of low blood pressure but otherwise well and but you know with time all these things get a lot easier you'll get used to the routine of what to do you'll be able to recognize patterns you'll remember the kind of initial things that you can do as an F1 to treat certain things that will come a lot more easier to you um, and things do get easier <laughs> um, both in terms of spending less time on a task or you know finding the day less taxing as you go on you know unfortunately for most people everyone finds F1 difficult at the beginning because it's a completely new way of working that you've never done before it's something that you're not used to it's something that personally I don't think most medical schools prepare you very well for. It is difficult, it is stressful, it is exhausting, um, but just remember to take care of yourself and know that you know by the, by the time that you've ended F1, you'll be so much more used to the hospital environment than you were. And it's probably one of the biggest jumps you ever have to do in your career is going from a medical student graduate to being a doctor. And hopefully you have found it enjoyable like I did as well. And that's it for the video. I hope this has been useful for those of you who have just started your F1 years or for medical students in their final years looking to hear about a bit about what F1 is like and for some tips and stuff. Um, if you liked the video, please don't forget to leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Um, again, I'm really sorry about the lighting situation. Uh, there's really nothing I can do aside from order a new light and hope it arrives soonish. Um, but that's it for now and I'll see you next time.